Καλησπέρα φίλοι και φίλες. Ε, ευχαριστώ όλους όσους είστε εδώ. Ε, και εκ μέρους ε, της Εταιρείας Σταθερός Πλήρωσης Βορείου Ελλάδος σας ε, καλημερίζω ε, στο συνέδριό μας. Ε, ο επόμενος καλεσμένος ε, είναι ο, ένας φίλος από τα παλιά. Ε, ε, είναι Άγγλος, οπότε θα μιλήσω από εδώ και πέρα και η διάλεξη που θα δοθεί στα αγγλικά. Οπότε α, από εδώ και πέρα θα μιλάω θα μιλάμε αγγλικά. Νομίζω περισσότερο από εσάς μπορείτε να ε, ε, παρακολουθήσετε. Ε, και ο Ρόμπ μιλάει καλά αγγλικά και ήρεμα, οπότε θα μπορέσετε να παρακολουθήσετε. So, it is uh, my great pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Professor Robert Story. Robert Story is um, a dear friend of mine. Uh, I was working with him uh, some years ago. He's... Um, let's say, a leader in uh, research concerning uh, antiplatelet therapy. And uh, um, he's going to talk to us about antiplatelet therapy for management and prevention of atherothrombosis. So uh, he's done uh, great research on, the, on, this, uh, top, on this topic. And uh, we are waiting uh, for his lecture. Well, uh, Rob, uh, Welcome, and actually it's a vast era of uh, research you've done in antiplatelet therapy, it's, uh, so we are waiting for you so for some new data concerning chronic uh, coronary artery disease and acute coronary artery disease. Um, so you know it's a lecture, uh, but uh, we would like to have some questions at the end, so be prepared, okay? Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Chris. A uh, great pleasure to be here and give this talk about antiplatelet therapy. Uh, firstly, my disclosures uh, relate to quite a number of different companies working in this field. Now, we know from various studies, uh, including Plato, that potent PTY12 inhibition, more effective than clopidogrel in preventing uh, ischemic events, including um, ticagrelor here in those without revascularization, who had higher risk, reducing mortality compared to clopidogrel. Similar reduction in those who were revascularized, but they were lower risk patients. Now, potent PTY12 inhibition does come with risk of more spontaneous bleeding, as shown in Plato, but uh, no significant difference with a reversibly binding PTY12 inhibitor to Cagrelor in terms of surgery, and I'll talk more about that. But it's important to get into um, focus what is the main causes of death in these acute coronary syndrome patients. And in this cause of death analysis, uh, we see that in this trial population, who did exclude some patients with high bleeding risk conditions, such as prior intracranial hemorrhage, in, in this population, thrombotic events are by far the largest cause of death, whereas death due to bleeding is rare and did not seem to be influenced significantly with ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel. Now, after we in introduced potent P2Y12 inhibition in our center, uh, and this is more than 10,000 patients, we saw a halving of the stent thrombosis rate, and most of that being an impact on acute stent thrombosis. And when we looked at independent predictors, we not only saw that clopidogrel was an independent predictor of stent thrombosis, but also STEMI. And this raised the question, why is STEMI associated with more stent thrombosis? Now this is relevant when we come to interpret the results of ISAR REACT-5, which um, compared two different strategies, a pretreatment strategy with ticagrelor before angiogram and a prasugrel strategy where patients who had the angiogram um, without pretreatment then had prasugrel if they were proceeding to PCI. And this showed better outcomes with the prasugrel strategy, although there was quite a bit of crossover. But interestingly, there was a 1.1% definite stent thrombosis rate with ticagrelor lower with prasugrel. And this is not something that we've seen in my practice where we've been using it. Now, it's important to realize that 
all the P2Y12 inhibitors, all the oral P2Y12 inhibitors are absorbed from the intestine. And what we see is that opiates like morphine delay the absorption of the P2Y12 inhibitors because morphine and other opiates delay gastric emptying. Whereas aspirin, on the other hand, is absorbed from the stomach and so not, does not seem to be significantly affected by opiates. And when we realized this, before we realized this, we were seeing this 1.1% acute stent thrombosis rate with all our um, ACS patients treated with primary PCI. And when we introduced a, a guideline locally to use tyrofiban for six hours, we more than halved the uh, acute stent thrombosis. And you'll see that after 24 hours, we see virtually um, nearly 0% as subacute stent thrombosis with a pretreatment uh, to Cagrelor's first line uh, option. So, what are the options for dealing with this um, delayed absorption of P2Y12 inhibitors? Well, we can use Cangrelor, although this is obviously expensive and just gives you a two hour infusion for most uh, cases with the standard treatment. And with an hour or so of stopping the infusion, it wears off. So uh, a two-hour infusion may not be enough to cover the delayed absorption, which can be up to eight hours. So that agril is a novel subcutaneous P2Y12 inhibitor in development. And a single subcutaneous injection gives you uh, effective P2Y12 inhibition for four to eight hours. And this is currently being studied in a phase three study, so it's not yet available. We've also in my center looked at targeting thrombin-induced platelet activation because thrombin not only leads to coagulation, it's also a very important platelet activator. And as shown here, thrombin is another pathway of platelet activation beyond those targeted by aspirin and P2Y12 inhibitors. And so we've looked at giving an oxaparin, um, which binds to antithrombin-3 to inhibit thrombin. And we've studied this in a small study where we've given a 0.75 milligrams per kilogram bolus, followed by a six-hour infusion. And uh, that sustains anti-10A levels. And we're just um, getting some initial um, clinical data on this approach. So back to clopidogrel. Clopidogrel is a very difficult drug to use because in about 30% of patients, it's a little different to placebo. So on the left side is ticagrelor at two different doses, maintenance doses compared to placebo. On the right is clopidogrel compared to ticagrelor. And we see considerable overlap between clopidogrel and placebo in terms of platelet reactivity whereas ticagrelor has a more consistent response. Now, there's a lot, been a lot of talk about genotyping, and genotyping increases your chances of selecting patients who respond to clopidogrel, but it is not a solution, because even as shown here on the right, patients treated with clopidogrel in blue who don't carry a loss of function allele still have a wide variability of response. So genotyping only helps take you part of the way to predicting who will or won't respond to clopidogrel. Whereas with ticagrelor and prasugrel to some extent, a much more predictable um, response. But the flip side to this is that about 30% of patients treated with clopidogrel have a high response. As shown here, there's overlap in about 30% of clopidogrel treated patients with the platelet reactivity you see on ticagrelor. So you also have high responders to clopidogrel as well as poor responders. And this may explain why in the PLATO study, there were no more deaths due to or associated with bleeding with clopidogrel in the cohort of patients who were treated with bypass surgery. 
since Plato, we've had more uh, options now for exploiting the reversibility of ticagrelor. This device, the Cytosorb, is a hemoabsorption hemo cartridge that removes small molecules, and it's CE marked for removing ticagrelor and also rivaroxaban, so it removes also the anti-10A uh, drugs. And also in phase three development is an antibody to ticagrelor which reverses the inhibitory effects and, uh, and the initial data suggest promise for this approach. But this is again not yet available. So that is the, some of the issues with acute treatment. What about long-term treatment? Because we know that there's patients at very high risk of ischemic events. Shown here, over seven years, patients with polyvascular disease and diabetes had a 50% rate of cardiovascular death, MI, or stroke. And a lot of this risk relates to vulnerable plaque. This was a study we did of uh, CT, coronary angiography, in ACS patients. And on the left is the patients with or without high calcified plaque burden. And calcified plaque burden didn't seem to impact on risk. Whereas on the right, in green, is patients with a high burden of non-calcified plaque. And these were the patients who seemed to have the ongoing events of MI and death. So if we can select patients who are at risk of progression of their atherosclerotic disease, um, then we can identify those at highest risk of further MI. And in Pegasus, ticagrelor seemed to be particularly effective, including a trend towards reduced coronary heart disease-related death in the patients with multivessel disease. And in many different subgroup analyses, we see a picture of those who are at highest risk have the greatest absolute benefit from intensified antithrombotic treatment, including those with diabetes who are at higher risk of coronary heart disease-related death and benefit more in terms of absolute risk reduction with long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. But there are those patients who don't seem to benefit, and that is the patients with high bleeding risk. In these patients, we see the bleeding events may lead to increased mortality risk. And if we exclude those patients from long-term treatment and just select a cohort at high ischemic risk, who don't have high bleeding risk conditions, then we can achieve the most benefit with long-term therapy. And in this analysis, if we take out the patients with anemia or prior hospitalization for bleeding, as well as excluding those with the trial exclusion criteria, such as prior intracranial hemorrhage, the patients with anemia or prior hospitalization for bleeding didn't benefit from long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. Whereas if we exclude those, then we see increasing benefit in terms of cardiovascular mortality reduction with increasing ischemic risk. So for example, patients with multivessel coronary disease and diabetes or peripheral arterial disease or chronic kidney disease, these patients, if they don't have high bleeding risk, benefit apparently from reduced CV mortality um, with long-term dual antiplatelet therapy. And this led in 2019 to a recommendation for adding a second antithrombotic drug to aspirin for long-term secondary prevention in patients with high risk of ischemic events and without high bleeding risk with a class 2A recommendation. But what about those patients who have high bleeding risk or don't have a high ischemic risk? Can we reduce their bleeding by reducing the intensity of platelet inhibition? Now you can switch from prasugrel or ticagrelor to clopidogrel in combination with aspirin, 
But as I said, 30% of the patients will still have a high response to clopidogrel, so you may not achieve anything. Or 30% of patients may have a poor response to clopidogrel, and so they may be at higher risk of stent thrombosis. So a more predictable option is to continue ticagrelor or prasugrel and stop aspirin, because then that leads to recovery of the thromboxane A2 pathway and recovery of some platelet reactivity. And this approach was tested in twilight where aspirin was dropped at three months after PCI and ticangrelor continued. And this led to much less bleeding compared to continuing dual antiplatelet therapy. And in this cohort of patients at three months post PCI, dropping aspirin did not lead to any increase in ischemic events. So this seems on the surface of it quite an attractive option. And this has been replicated in other studies. What about beyond six months after PCI? Can you, if you're treating with aspirin and clopidogrel, can you stop the aspirin and just use clopidogrel? Well, between six and 18 months after PCI, when the risk of stent thrombosis has gone, this seemed quite an attractive option in the host exam study. Although you'll note that the all-cause mortality was numerically higher in the clopidogrel group, leaving some uncertainty about the impact on overall mortality risk. And in meta-analysis, looking at all-cause death, MI or stroke, monotherapy with clopidogrel or the newer P2Y12 inhibitors the point estimate favored monotherapy compared to dual antiplatelet therapy. All cause mortality seemed lower with the newer P2Y12 inhibitors, mainly to Cangrelor, whereas the point estimate moved in the opposite direction for clopidogrel. But both um, monotherapy with clopidogrel or with newer P2Y12 inhibitors led to much less bleeding, as you would expect. So this seems to be a good option for those who don't have high ischemic risk or have a high bleeding risk. What about patients who have an indication for oral anticoagulation? Mainly patients with atrial fibrillation. Now, as I said, thrombin is an important activator of platelets as well as triggering coagulation. So if you inhibit the action and or the formation of thrombin, then you can indirectly or directly inhibit platelet activation. And so you may not need to inhibit all three of these pathways of platelet activation. This was studied to some extent in Augustus where dropping aspirin between um, within two weeks of acute coronary syndrome and or PCI led to much less bleeding. On the other hand, there was numerically more stent thrombosis when you drop the aspirin compared to continuing it. Now, most of these patients were treated with clopidogrel. When we looked at the um, less than 300 patients treated with ticagrelor, and around 50 patients were treated with prasugrel, there was not really enough data to um, get a good idea of how effective dual therapy with those agents is. So we rely on observational data. But the guidelines have um, taken a view that you look at the risk of stent thrombosis and you look at the bleeding risk and make an individual decision. So 2A recommendation for early cessation of aspirin in those who don't have a high risk of stent thrombosis or if they have a high bleeding risk. And just using triple therapy with aspirin, clopidogrel, and anticoagulant for a month or maybe more, if the risk of stent thrombosis outweighs the bleeding risk. But as I said before, clopidogrel, you may have a high response in 30% of patients. So you're still giving quite a potent triple therapy uh, to some patients. So a more predictable option is just to stop the aspirin and use a potent P2Y12 inhibitor along with preferably a NOAC 
in those where you're concerned about the stent thrombosis risk. And this had a 2B recommendation because at the moment this is just mainly based on uh, opinion without a lot of evidence. Having said that, this is a strategy that we've embraced in my center using twice daily apixaban, twice daily ticagrelor um, without aspirin, stopping aspirin straight after PCI. And this has been uh, so far quite uh, promising. But it's important to stress that uh, there's a class three recommendation against using prasugrel or ticagrelor as triple therapy. So in conclusion, potent PTY12 inhibition offers predictability of platelet inhibition versus unpredictable response to clopidogrel. We see debates about the pros and cons of prasugrel versus ticagrelor, um, and there still are pros and cons for each strategy. But our real world evidence shows ticagrelor highly effective when we start it before the angiogram. And in our center, patients often have to wait um, many days before they have their angiogram and so this is a good strategy for stabilizing patients. But in the STEMI patients who've received opiate, you need to use parenteral therapy for six hours to cover the delayed absorption of oral P2Y12 inhibitors. In patients with extensive coronary artery disease and long-term risk factors that you can't completely modify, such as kidney disease or diabetes, these patients with high long-term ischemic risk, if they don't have high bleeding risk conditions, benefit with lower mortality risk with long-term dual therapy. On the other hand, stopping aspirin and con continuing a potent P2Y12 inhibitor is a very predictable way of reducing platelet inhibition and it lowers bleeding risk without increasing ischemic risk in selected patients as seen in the uh, trials. We see various strategies either in development or now available for exploiting the reversible binding of ticagrelor. And this may be an increasing advantage of this strategy over the long term. And we need more work on the optimal combination of antithrombotic drugs in atrial fibrillation patients. But our institutional experience for potent P2Y12 inhibition and a twice daily NOAC without aspirin has been very promising and, uh, and that's something we're studying further. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to answer questions. Okay, thank you very much Rob for uh this impressive uh, lecture of yours. So uh, we have some time for questions. Dimitri, uh, do you like, you have the chance to ask uh, Rob some of your uh, nice questions. So till Dimitri uh, can uh, find his first question, <laughs> I can ask you. So um, in, in Greece the, recently, a kangaroo is available. Uh, but in our institution, we don't use it. Um, so it's, it's, it came recently. So uh, your, um, clinical, in your clinical practice, in STEMI patients, so you see the STEMI, uh, if, for example, it comes to in uh, the emergency department in Sheffield, you see the patient, you give him uh, aspirin, and then you load him intravenously with Cangrelor going to the cath lab mm -hmm. what are you doing because this is the this is the i think this is the right way to do it, mm -hmm. it I, I i think yes i mean kangalore is a very nice strategy except the uh, the expense but but, but it, the main the issue cost. is expense which is why we're not using that because you would need in a morphine treated patient you'd need to um infuse kangalore for about six hours six hours yeah uh, in order to cover delayed ob absorption because when a patient has a dose of uh, treatment with morphine you can it's quite common that the absorption you know is delayed by more than six hours so when we've looked at this we see quite a high proportion of patients with no platelet inhibition at six hours after loading dose um, with a P2Y12 inhibitor so you need to cover for six hours when the patients have had a dose of morphine 
maybe with fentanyl it's a bit shorter acting so you may need a, a, right. a less duration but um so that's why we've not uh, adopted a kangalore strategy why we've initially used tyrofiban for six hour infusion uh, and more recently uh, experimenting with infusing inoxaparin for six hours which is less expensive again but also um um you know, it's more controlled, you don't have the bleeding risk. Well, I mean, in the acute setting, Rob, yeah. in the acute setting of STEMI, so yeah. you're using, uh, let's say, tirofibine or uh, an oxaparin? Yeah. 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 If they plus, have... plus aspirin plus decagrelor. Yes, or prasugrel. Yeah. Or prasugrel, yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, have your clinical practice changed after eyes are react between uh, prasugrel and uh, decagrelor? Yeah. I mean, so. Um, not initially, because there were too many issues with the trial to really make us change our, our practice. We, we treated many more patients with Ticagrelor in our institution than had been studied in ISR React 5. And our data were much more in a real world population, showed much lower risks of stent thrombosis than was seen in ISR React 5. So something went wrong with the way Ticagrelor was handled in ISR React 5. Um, which is why we didn't change initially. But uh, since subsequently, Parasagrel has become generic and so it's a lot cheaper. So we've been under cost pressure to use um, more Parasagrel, um, um, you know, whilst Ticagrelor is branded and Parasagrel is generic now, there's quite a big cost differential. So NICE have um, promoted the use of Parasagrel in STEMI patients if they don't have contraindications like prior stroke. Uh, and so we're using a mix, really, of, uh, of the drugs now. Would you, would you stop aspirin and use uh, ticagrelor as monotherapy in this patient? So, yeah, so stopping aspirin and using ticagrelor monotherapy, I think we've seen is a very good option in high bleeding risk patients. Obviously, you need to, you know, wait until the risk of stent thrombosis diminishes. We don't really know whether you need to wait for three months, as in twilight, or one month, as in global leaders. Um, and it will differ between different patients. But, um, you know, somewhere between one and three months, it seems that stopping aspirin is uh, beneficial in terms of reducing bleeding risk in patients who don't have a very high long-term atherothrombotic risk. How about long-term? Instead of using uh, tagagrelol plus uh, 60 milligrams plus aspirin, just use tagagrelol. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, at the moment, we don't have enough data for monotherapy long-term in patients who have high ischemic risk without high bleeding risk. Now, it, it may be sufficient, but the trials comparing ticagrelor with aspirin as monotherapy so far um, have not really um, supported that as a superior approach. There are signals on meta-analysis that suggest that you know, maybe the best approach. But if you stop aspirin and just continue to or monotherapy, you do have less platelet inhibition. So it's quite probable that in those who are having um, rupture of very thrombotic plaques, that monotherapy may not be uh, as effective as dual therapy. So I think that's a gap in our knowledge at the moment. Um, but the pharmacology would say that dual antiplatelet therapy is going to be more effective in those very high risk patients uh, than single therapy. Okay, I think we have no questions. So uh, Rob, thank you again. Thank you. Uh, it's, it was very nice to see you again in uh, Greece. And we give the next step to the next step, Mr. Kurtoglu and Mr. Skuta.